Get your Bible ready. We're going to be all over the place today. Um, I can't take you to one particular scripture. But in January, you know, we've been praying. We decided, we made a designation that January was going to be the month that we, as a fellowship of believers, would begin to pray in four different areas of life. Hit my slide there for me, would you, Mason? So I don't lose my place. Oh, I might lose my place with the slide. So <laughs> making a difference in our community. So the last part of this, the, the week four, was community and civic. We wanted to pray for community and civic. But we started out praying for our own personal lives. We said, put your oxygen, ma oxygen mask on first, like they do in the airplane. Make sure that you're together with the Lord. If there's stuff you need to deal with, deal with it. And so we spent that first week with them. I mean, you can spend every week with them, but that was kind of how we designated. The second week was about family and praying and fighting spiritual warfare and families, because every family is fighting spiritual warfare right now. We talked about church last week, the ecclesia, the gathering of people. That's who we really are. We're going to pick up on that today to talk about what the church is supposed to do in our community and praying for our community, every area of the community, starting with with police and fire, first responders. Kyle, thank you for your service, sir. We, we appreciate what you do. Uh, civic leaders, schools, teachers, administrators, business and economic, all areas of the community. We are, as God's representatives, supposed, we are supposed to touch every area of the community, every area of life. We are not supposed to segment ourselves off into this building. We are not supposed to pull ourselves out and not touch the community and, and the culture. We're supposed to impact the culture. That's what we want to look at today. Jeremiah 29, verse 7 says this, Seek the welfare of the city I have sent you. And he was talking to a group of people who've been taken away from their home. So he says, Seek the, the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Whose behalf? The city where I've sent you, the place where I've sent you. You pray for that city on their behalf because... If it goes well with that city, it says, for in its welfare, you will have welfare. In other words, if the city does well because the community leaders make good decisions because you are praying that God influences them, then it's going to go well with you. And we want it to go well with us, right? Yeah. So the only way, if we can't do that by pulling ourselves out and segmenting ourselves and say we don't want to get stained by the world. The Bible says, yeah, we don't want to be stained by the world. But he says, I didn't, for Jesus said, I didn't ask you to pull them out of the world, Lord. I asked you to keep them unstained from sin. To keep them from being overcome by the world. That is our mission. That is our focus. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now, you say, that's kind of hard. Sometimes I feel alone outside of this building. Well, Matthew 18, verse 20 says this, For where two or three, where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. See, God has a promise to be part of us if we gather in his name. That's good news, right? All right, so we gather here on Sunday mornings, and our focus on Sunday mornings should be his agenda, not our own. Our focus, because we are his church, and he has an agenda for his church. We are the, and the Greek word is ekklesia. Kind of a cool name, kind of a cool word. Ekklesia is the gathering of people together as the church, the fellowship of believers who come together to worship him, and we come to hear from him. We want to hear from God, don't we? That's why we read so much Bible in, on Sunday morning. That's why we sing about him and talk about him. We want to know what he has to say. So we want to hear from him so that we can align ourselves with his purposes so that the output of our life looks like he wants it to look, right? Are you with me? It's awful quiet now all of a sudden. <laughs> don't get quiet on me now. We're here. I'll put it this way. This is a little more direct. We're here on his time. He created time, and it's his time, and he's letting us live here in the here and now, and he says, what are you going to do for me? What are you doing for me? I get it. Yeah, we, as North Americans, we are the most blessed of anybody who's ever lived on the planet because we have prosperity and, and so far peace and opportunity to do things that we enjoy, and God is not against doing things that we enjoy. He wants us to do things that we enjoy. What he doesn't want to have happen is that we enjoy the enjoyment more than we enjoy the enjoy giver. Are you with me? Oh, amen. Okay. So Jesus said to, to the church, he said something. See, we get worried about building the church. You know, well, what's the mission of the church? And if you ask people what's the mission of the church, people say, well, we're supposed to build the church. And you know what? 
And, I, and if you said that in your head, I'm just going to tell you that's not the right answer. It'd be like when I was sitting in algebra class and I was figuring out all that in my head and I was wrong when I spoke the answer. And so, it, it, but, but, but if we say we're here to build the church, that's not the right answer. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. Right? Jesus said, I will build my church. So if that's the case, if the wrong answer is to build the church, then what is the right answer? Because it's not about the physical building. It's not about getting people to come to fill it up to say, we use a scorecard. And the scorecard says, oh, if the building's full of people, serving over. <laughs> this is why I stay pulling together. Um, if the building's full, though, we must be doing something right. And that may be true, but the purpose is not to fill the building. The scorecard is not how many people showed up. The scorecard is not how much money did we collect. That is not the purpose of the church. So what is the purpose of the church? Well, let's find that out. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. So what did he leave us to do? If we're not supposed to build the church, what are we supposed to do? Go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28 in your Bible. What is the mission of the church? If we're not supposed to build the church, what are we supposed to be doing? Now, when I'm done, you're going to say, well, you're just parsing words. And I might be, but I just want to keep our focus right. All right? I, might, I might, be, might be taking this just in one little vein here. But there are really two things, two things that we need to do because we're on a mission for the king, aren't we? And he says it's his church. So what did he send us to do? What is the mission he gave us? And then he tells us that part of it in Matthew 28. He's standing out on a hill right before he leaves. Mount of Olives, right? Because he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. When he comes back to step foot on the earth again, he's going to step on the same place he gave these words. All right? And he said to his disciples and to us in Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the first thing he gave us to do is not fill the building. He said, go, make disciples. Well, that's a whole lot easier to talk about than it is to do, isn't it? But that's the first thing we're supposed to do. Go and make disciples. Now flip over in your Bible to Acts chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. First chapter of Acts. Same location. Jesus is standing in the same place. This is the same scenario. It's right before he took, went up into heaven. So it's standing right there. So he's giving his disciples some last minute instructions. This is what I want you to do. So he's telling you, he's told them, he said, I want you to go and make disciples. That's the first thing I want you to do. And the second thing he said, the second thing he said, is something that we, I think, miss sometimes. Because what he said here is how we take the church to the street, taking it to the street, <laughs> is how we're supposed to do that. If I had a little more rhythm, I'd do that for you this morning. But taking it to the street is what we're supposed to do. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, But you, his disciples and us, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. In Judea, or in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So he gave us two things to do. He said, go and make disciples, and go be my witnesses. You go, isn't that one and the same? Kind of, sort of, but it's different, right? It's different, because making disciples, that's just preaching the gospel and, and connecting people to him so that they are eternally connected in relationship restored. But being his witnesses is populating everywhere we go and everything we, we do with what the kingdom goodness in our life is. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me? So we need to take all the blessings, that, here, I'll put it this way, all the blessings that he gives us, we're supposed to take and bless others. If he gives you peace in your heart, you need to take and share that peace with people who don't have peace. Because there's a lot of people today who don't have peace, aren't there? Right? If he gives you joy, share your joy. If he gives you love, we're all supposed to love. There's no exception to that. Someone said, well, God didn't give me the gift of love. Yes, he did. He gave me the gift of love. So he said to go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We'll break this down. Jerusalem is home. All right? There's four things. It's like home. So I like to be at home. So we are to be his witnesses at home. Whenever, whoever comes in your home, you should be a witness to them. Judea are people like me 
and places I like to go. So that was the area right outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Judea. I like to go out there. You know, I go to a little place here and a little place there because I like to go there. And so we are to share in those little places we like to go. So, so far we are home, sharing in home, sharing in the places with the people we know and the places we like to go. Samaria is different. Because Samaria was the place where there was some racial tension. There was some racial tension in Samaria because the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. And the Samaritans, because they didn't like, got, didn't get liked first, didn't like the Jews back. And that was because they were uh, multi-ethnic in race. And Jesus said, we don't like you. So Samaria, he said, to be witnesses in Samaria. In other words, we need to be witnesses to places they, people, Jews didn't like to go to Samaria, and they didn't like to hang out with the Samaritans. And it was a race thing, quite <clears throat> frankly. And Jesus said, go there anyway. And be what witnesses. So we need to go to home, places we like to be, and Judea, places we like to go, and Samaria, places we don't like to go. Okay? And the last one is the othermost parts of the earth. Places I have no idea about. Places I've only seen on a map. Places that I might have read about, I might have heard about, I might have saw a YouTube video about, I might have studied in school. I don't know anything about it. And he says, go there too. You are my witnesses. Go everywhere. Don't stay in this building. Go everywhere. Populate everywhere. And he talks about the kingdom. So we are to be the representatives, the gathering, the ecclesia representatives, on a mission to be his witnesses everywhere we go. And with whatever he's done in your life, you share that. If you have been radically changed, you have a message to give to somebody. Matthew. I'm going to pick on Matthew just a second. Because you talk about radical change. See, sometimes in the church, you've heard me say this before, it is my bugaboo. Because I can smell marketing words being used for the sake of being marketing words. They use them, but they don't really mean them. And I've heard churches say, we're all about radical change. And I'm going, you're just using that because it sounds cool. Where's your true radical change? I will, I will tell you. And there's others of you sitting here. This morning on, I'm radical change. Because I am nothing like I used to be. Matthew tells me about his past. I'm going, there's no way. <laughs> you don't seem, you know, you seem too nice for that. He goes, no, you should have known me back then. That is radical change. If you have that in your life, and really we all do, right? Yeah. Really we all do. Yeah. That is what we need to go and share with someone else. Because somebody needs to hear it. Because somebody's sitting there going, I don't have any hope to change. I'm never going to change. Life is too hard for me. I've been too deep in this too long. So yeah, there's still, there's still hope for you. That is our mission. Are you with me? Amen. All right. So Matthew 6.33. We've read this a couple of times this morning. Here's how we stay focused. All right? So we're the church. We're on a mission. We're supposed to go make disciples. We're supposed to be his witnesses. Here's how we keep that focus so we don't, what they call, mission drift. So we don't get off. In Matthew 6.33, if you turn in there, it says this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I don't want to talk about all these things, because that could be a lot of things, because it is God will be for you in your mission, in your call, in what he has called you to do in your life. He will do for you what you need. You will have what you need to serve the king in your time. All right? That's what that means. Let's focus on the other. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The ecclesia, we are the collection of individuals, and we are to represent... The king, and he's a king because he has a kingdom. The kingdom of God. We are on journey, on mission for Jesus to represent him and his kingdom. The first thing Jesus said was, what? Remember the first message he preached? He says, repent for the churches at hand. No, he didn't, did he? He said, repent for the kingdom <coughs> is at hand. Ah! Oh! Do you know Jesus only talked about the church three times? Not that it wasn't important. It's the setup. It's the institution through which he's going to do everything kingdom-wise through us, the church. But do you know how many times he talked about the kingdom? He talked about the kingdom over 80 times. 
He specifically talked about the kingdom 80 times, but he only talked about the church three times. And what that means is, is that when it says, seek first his kingdom, that means his kingdom. Don't cross-pollinate the culture. Don't cross-pollinate a bunch of other stuff in with the mix on the mission, right? Are you with me? So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I think the problem with the North American church, and I said it last week, and I'll say it again, it started in my generation. We got off on mission. We had mission drift. And the stuff that kind of sounded good was not necessarily kingdom focused. And we've got off to the point where now people are so unimpressed by the church. The church should be the most impressive thing out there because of what God does in our life. Are you with me? So people are unimpressed by it because why? Because we've watered it down. We brought a whole bunch of culture into the church and it's not going to make a difference in people's lives. People go, well, I can get that. I, I said something one time in another place, in another time. They were talking about coffee and donuts. Oh, you know what would be great? We'll get people to come to church and we have coffee and donuts. I go, do you realize? Now, I, wasn't, I was probably not being nice because I was annoyed. I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> I said, you realize that when you go to a Chicago Bears game, they have gourmet food there? <laughs> so we got coffee and donuts, but if you want to go to Chicago on a sunny morning to watch the Bears play, and I don't know why anybody would want to do that anymore, as I bleed orange and blue, but <laughs> you go, I can go to Chicago and get gourmet food on a Sunday morning. So don't be too enamored with your coffee and your donuts. If that's your calling card, somebody's going to out calling your card, right? Yeah. Oh, somebody's got gourmet donuts. Ooh. Then somebody's going to go, oh, I've got industrial donuts. You know, in Terre Haute, Indiana, they have square donuts, don't yeah. they? <laughs> I was in a meeting the other day, they had square donuts on the table. Oh, yeah. And these guys, these guys are going, oh, i got to have another one of those. I'm going, if they're that good, I need to stay away from them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway. So they got square donuts. What kind of donuts do you serve on Sunday morning? Because that's not our calling card, right? We get off and it doesn't take much off to mess up everything what's it say a little leaven leavens a whole lump doesn't it doesn't take a whole lot of something to mess up everything you don't have to bring a whole lot of culture into the church and all of a sudden you are watered down to the point where people go what's it got to mean i mean what's really there and jesus is talking about stuff that we call radical change he's saying it is powerful you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and sometimes the church doesn't look very powerful today, does it? <laughs> but it should, right? Right? Right. Oh. <laughs> Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. Seek is this. Zateo. Zateo is Greek. And it says to seek by thinking, by meditating, by reasoning, to inquire. In other words, seek first his kingdom. How do you do that? I'm all about it. I think about it all the time. What's it mean to be the kingdom? We should ask ourselves that question every day. What does it mean to be the kingdom? How am I, or put it this way, how am I going to be the kingdom today? How am I, because I have breath and I have life and I have health and I have ability to walk forward today. God's called me into somebody. He has an assignment for me today as the church. So how am I representing the kingdom well on my assignment today? That is what we're supposed to be thinking about. Second thing, the kingdom is rule and authority. Basilia is the Greek word he used there, and it means rule and authority. Seek first his kingdom, his what? His rule and authority. Seek deeply his rule and authority is what that's saying. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, which means there is nowhere higher to go. There is nowhere higher you can appeal your cause. Everybody wants to go to the Supreme Court. I'm going to tell you the higher place to go is Jesus Christ. There is no place higher to go than him. All authority has been given to him. In heaven and on earth. If he is our king, and this is his kingdom, and all his kingdom has all rule and all authority, I don't want to represent anybody else. I can't represent anybody else to make any difference. Are you with me? Amen. The last thing is righteousness. This one's tough. Because every one of us, every day, can go, man, I wish I could redo that. I wish I could re-say that. I wish I could rethink that. Those are the things we'll be judged on, by the way. Our thoughts, 
our words, and our deeds. Someday we'll stand before Jesus as his followers. He'll say, let's take a look. How'd you do in my name? In the time I gave you? And, and he will judge every thought, every word, and every deed. So, we bring that in here. So, in righteousness, sometimes you go, yeah, I didn't play that one well. I'm sorry, Lord. And that's how we need to roll with that. But righteousness is what holiness looks like. So as we are leaving the house, knowing that we have an assignment today, knowing that there's something and somebody I need to talk to, and I don't know about you, this happened to me on Friday, Thursday, when I can't, the days all run together, sitting in a conference room, and the meeting was all done, and this guy started asking me Bible questions. And he said, so what do you think all this means? And we had a little discussion what all I thought this means. And I didn't expect that that day. But that we had to be ready. And that's how we have to look at this. Because we are in a time that it's not that hard to be light. Look, when I go out walking it in the morning, and I take my little flashlight, it's super dark. But that little flashlight, little flashlight, makes a lot of light when it's super dark. You and I make a lot of light in a dark culture. You and I make a little light in our culture. We are to be the salt and light. And so it doesn't take much light to shine into somebody's darkness. And they'll appreciate that, right? right? So we go out equipped knowing that we're on a mission for the king who has all rule and all authority. And we are to represent him in righteousness. Righteousness is what holiness looks like. So, what, you know, that's great. I still haven't landed the plane. Let me land the plane. What that looks like is integrity. Do we live our life with integrity? Do we live our life with virtue? Are we pure, pursuing purity in a culture that completely is not pure anymore? Can I get an amen? Amen. Are we correct in our thinking? Are we focused on that? When we leave the house, how we feel, how we act, how we, how we represent ourselves. He's saying, you are on mission for me. How are you going to do this today? How are you going to do this today? So that is our work. So that's how we make that happen. So as the church, we must be active in pursuing his kingdom and his righteousness, thinking about it every day, striving to live right every day. We're not going to be perfect. And I'm the first guy in line that's not going to be perfect. Put me in the wrong line. Okay. But that doesn't mean we don't try, right? We've got to try for that. We've got to pursue it. And every day it'll get a little easier. It's like lifting weights. Every day it gets a little easier, doesn't it, Melvin? You do it every day and it starts to get a little easier. And the more you do it, the more weight you can lift. Same deal. The more we try it, the, more it's, the easier it's going to be. So with that, Jesus wants us to represent him in our time. To take the perspective of the kingdom to everywhere we go and everybody we meet. Every minute of the day. Are you with me? Hit that next slide for me, Mason. Oh, I missed one. Just leave it right there. That's okay. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. I've quoted a gentleman by the name of Reggie McNeil before. Really like his, his writing. Really like his perspective. Our churches of God commissioned him, hired him for 10 years to work with our churches and church leaders to get this right because we weren't right. We didn't have the right perspective as a, as a group of churches, the churches of God. And we recognize that. I've heard Bob Etherton say, you know what? When we, got, when we started thinking about it and we started looking at it, we realized we were off and we got on our knees and repented. And we said, Lord, we've got to figure out this thing. We've got to make this thing right. And I will tell you, he's one of the greatest guys ever because he took a chance on me. So anyway, <coughs> can't go there this morning. Bob, I love Bob. By the way, didn't mean to say this, but I texted him the other day. And uh, don't let me forget where I'm at here. Reggie McNeil. So I texted Bob the other day, and I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, hey, i got to go to the doctor. Uh, they're going to take um, some skin cancer off my, off my nose. I said, all right, man, I'll be, be praying for you. And uh, so that was Friday. And uh, so yesterday I sent him a text and I said, hey, how did that go yesterday? He said, do you know? I got there and they couldn't find the cancer. 
I said, I'm sharing that information. That was just awesome. So thank the Lord today when you're asking, when you're saying your, your blessings and thanking him for stuff. Thank him that, for that, for Bob Etherton. Where was I? Reggie McNeil. So Reggie was one of the guys that they brought in. And Reggie has this tremendous perspective and really great grasp of what the church should look like in the kingdom mission. And he wrote this. He wrote this in his book called Kingdom Come. He says, our purpose as the church is to partner with God. We don't think about it that way, do we? Sometimes you think, oh, what am I supposed to do? What? Give me a job list. He said, Reggie said, we're not supposed to partner with God. Our purpose of the church is to partner with God in his redemptive mission to bring uh, the mission in the world to bring healing to the afflicted, binding up the brokenhearted, releasing people from captivity, and redeeming everything diminished by sin. Understand, everything has been diminished by sin, right? You and me have been diminished by sin. Everything's diminished by sin. So the afflicted, the brokenhearted, all diminished by sin. You go, where did he get that? Where did he see that? Did he just make that up? Because that sounds good. No, that's in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Because we see Jesus on his mission just doing what he was doing every day. He's interacting with people. And John the Baptist, who is his forerunner, telling, you know, prepare the way of the Lord. John was out there. Well, they put John in prison. And John was depressed because he was in prison here. He was doing what he was born to do. And they took him, put him in prison. He's sitting in prison. And so his disciples, John's disciples, apparently had talked to John. And John said, you go find him. Go find Jesus. And you ask him, are you the one, are you the one that we're, that we're following? Or is there someone else? Because I want to know. I'm sitting, and basically, I'm going I'm to read into this, his thought, okay? I'm sitting here in prison because of you. Are you the Messiah? Or did I miss this completely? Because sometimes, tell the truth, we go, God, where are you? Mm-hmm. Or am I the only one who says that once in a while? <laughs> we all say that, right? Amen. And John's going, God, where are you? So, this is Jesus' response to John's disciples in Luke chapter 7, verse 21. And it shows what Jesus was doing, and it tells you what he said. He said, verse 21, at that time... Jesus cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. Verse 22, and he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive the sight, the lame walk, the lepers have cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. He's saying, you go back and tell John what you've seen. Well, that's what he's saying to you and me. You go tell the world what you've seen. What have you seen? What have you seen in your life? What has he done for you in your life? Somebody needs to hear that. Somebody needs to hear it. Are you with me? You go back and tell. This is what's happened to me. You go out and say, this is what has been done in in Jesus' name in my life. And that is way more powerful than coffee and donuts on Sunday morning. It has been said that a Christian needs two perspectives. We need both the here and now and the hereafter. Because we really are living in two worlds. This kingdom, his kingdom, is in both places. Now, he is not here ruling on the earth. And, and we talked about this on Wednesday night a little bit. There's, there's, some, there's some people out there saying, well, you know, we're in the tribulation period now, and Jesus is ruling and reigning because of it. No, he's not. He's not ruling and reigning yet. He's not coming. He's not back yet. He's not stepped foot on the Mount of Olives yet. That's when he will rule and reign this earth, which means he is not ruling and reigning directly, but you know indirectly how Jesus rules and reigns? Are you tracking with me? You know where I'm going here. Through what we do. If we seek first his kingdom and seek his righteousness, and he rules our life in that way, and you and I go out and live that way, 
then Jesus is ruling and reigning in our life and wherever we go, wherever we set foot, we are taking the kingdom with us. Are you with me? So why does he say, seek first? Because that's the way he rules and reigns now in our time. That's how this is done. This is the focus of the church. This is how we need to live. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you as I live and breathe, I think as we move forward from here on out, mark this day and time, from here on out, this is going to be the call of the church that we need to go and do. Because I'm telling you, there will be people, if something happens, and I'm not saying it will, okay? I'm saying if something happens, we have another 1929 whatever, stock market crash. There are going to be people running around with their hair on fire, going, what do I do? The church has to say, look, come to God. You need to come to God. You need to be ready. He's doing something, and He will help you. He will provide, but you've got to, you've got to come to Him now. And that's a whole different thing. I don't have time to go down there, and you wouldn't stay if I did today. Come on Wednesday night. We talk about it all the time. Because when we do that, all right, the changes that he has done in our life, people understand, wow, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Everybody feels that way. I, I didn't realize everybody had those problems. And he, that guy said he's a Christian. He's got those problems. Yeah. But here's how God helped me. All right, are you tracking with me? Kingdom pursuit is this. And all of that he's saying He's saying, seek the welfare for the city I've sent you. In other words, be proactive about this. Don't sit around and wait. Look for opportunity to serve. Look for opportunity where there's stuff where we need to step up. Look for opportunity to share the kingdom. Kingdom pursuit actively looks for and pursues and seeks to find areas of life that don't look righteous. Or that look beat up. Or people that have had all they could take in life. Kingdom pursuit looks for that and says, I'll help. Let me, let, me, let me start by praying. Right? Because there's no power in us. Where's the power come from? What did it say in Acts 1? Power is through the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That is our power. That is the focus. That's the only way we can do this. We can't just do it on our good looks. That is how we do this. So the mission of the church is to do the same, is to interact with people in the spiritual and the physical and the emotional aspects of their life. Are you with me? That's our purpose. That's our mission. You say, well, I'm not Jesus. I can't heal anybody. Well, no, but you can pray for him. God is the one who brings healing. Now, he might do it through... I had this discussion Friday, too, with this gentleman. I said, well, you know, God, God gives a lot of smart men and women information to be able to bring healing into life. Because he called me a Bible thumper, and he had me from that moment on. He's like, oh, if you want to talk, let's talk. <laughs> it was really, really it was a good discussion. He was just poking me a little bit. Healing can come from anywhere. God can do it directly. God can do it through the resource of something else. A doctor, a nurse, whatever. So, say I can't. Say God can. Are you with me? God can. And we also represent Him, it says in the New Testament, as kingdom priests. Peter called us that. It says that in Revelation, He made us a kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? What does a priest do? Well, a priest... Yeah, he preaches. He represents God to someone else. So... He represents God to someone else. And if we are kingdom priests, what are we supposed to do? Represent God to someone else. Everywhere we go, every time we leave the house, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. So, let me give you a couple of scriptures. Bob, come on up. For us to be effective, we have to keep our spiritual clarity Right? we got to keep our focus. Stay focused. So we always tell the kids, stay focused. <laughs> Follow me. We have to keep our spiritual clarity. 
How do we keep our spiritual clarity? One of the ways, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16. How do we keep our focus? Here's how we keep our focus. He says in verse 15, Paul says to the Ephesians, Therefore, verse 15, therefore be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Stay focused. Stay focused. Dr. Tony Evans said this. He's got some of the best teaching on this. If you want to go deeper than this today, go look his stuff up on, on the church and, and kingdom, and uh, our representation of the kingdom. He wrote this. God's people have been called to penetrate society as both salt and light. Christians must offer others hope because no earthly institution can offer real hope for the world. Understand, statistically, the last I think I saw, sometime last year, 40, 45% of people dealing with depression and anxiety because the world doesn't have a whole lot of hope and the world's got a lot to worry about. But he's saying the church is the only institution that can at least bring some hope to somebody because there's no hope anywhere else. See, my hope is in sports until your team loses. Your team loses, like, okay, I'm, I'm done watching. No hope there. You get the idea. idea. The absence of righteousness in our culture has everything to do with the absence of God's people influencing the culture. When Jesus Christ returns, we will no longer need to worry about transforming our culture because he will set up his kingdom rule, and it will be perfect. Everything will be right. But until that time, until that time, he says, we need to reach the world for him. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, it says, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, when it goes well there, it'll go well with you. There's a lot of people, there's people I have voted for that I disagree with, but I still need to pray for them, that they hear God, that they take what they know is right and what they know is wrong and make, make up legislation on that. And there's people I didn't vote for. Same thing. If we're going to change the culture, we need to start. We are called to pray for those leaders in, a, in our time. Right? Amen. To pray for those people. There is no hope in politics. Let me just say that straight up. If you're waiting on help from Air Force One, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because it's not coming. But there's hope in the church of Jesus Christ because the church of Jesus Christ connected to his kingdom. It's the kingdom that has the hope. You are his kingdom representatives. I am his kingdom representative. Would you stand with me this morning? Here's what I'd like to do. If we are to make a difference in our time, we have to have that mindset. We have to have that focus. We have to know. And I know it's hard because they call it Stormy Monday for a reason. And Tuesday's just as bad as what the song says. And I get it. It's easy to talk about it right in here. But tomorrow, the cold reality of Monday is going to hit us all in the face. But you know what? There's hope there too. Are you with me? Yes. That's what we need to pray for. That's why I'd like for us to pray this morning. In fact, I'm going to ask you to get uncomfortable and I'm ask you to come up front. We use this place as an altar to to come and seek God as a special place. That's all my ass is. Come on up. Let's come together. And let's, I want you all to come up and enjoy, join me up here. Because I want to pray that we make a difference as this fellowship, this group, this ecclesia. Come on. You're good. You're good. That we make a difference for him in our time, in our community. We, 